<clears throat> oh look, I'm back again. <laughs> back again. Doesn't that just make a handful of people in the world cringe? Anyway, still tired. Haven't quite recouped yet, but I will shortly. I've got a lot of meat to cut up yet. I'm doing it myself. And uh, it's pretty, a little cool out overnight. It's cool right now. The bugs haven't woken up, so I got the shop door open. No flies are coming in. This is where I'm cutting the meat up in here. So, anyway, um, yesterday's video. What a doozy, wasn't that? Wasn't that great hearing, hearing Mr. Ash's diaries? I could read those all day, every day. And the three-toed print mention and how they are not a good being. That really struck home with me because a friend of mine, Shane, remember, while well, I was hunting, a friend of mine sat on the porch. He found a three-toed print years back. Remember that? It scared the shit out of him. I'm going to have to get a hold of him. and He doesn't follow these videos, but I'm going to have to get a hold of him and share with him what I learned about the three-toed prints. They're actually up in the middle of nowhere right now, hunting, as we as I sit here. Uh, what else? I provided two links to two podcasts, whatever you want to call it, discussions that I feel are very, very important for as many people on the planet to hear as possible. And I did it because I need to do that, and I did my part. I did it. I shared it. I'm not scared to share it. I'm not scared to, to share how I feel and what I've learned, no matter what anybody says because I do my own due diligence like a hungry dog and I look for all different angles I can find from sources I feel and I have discovered for myself that are absolute truthful. That's what I do. And when I come across something I feel could be possibly vitally important for all of you, like my community, my people, I'm going to share it with you. And of course I'm going to add in, take from it what you will or leave it. But don't try to shut my mouth because that will end very badly for you no matter who you are, okay? So there, I've done my part. I am sharing honest knowledge with as many people as I can that I feel is important, and that's, that's what this channel's about. It's, it's sharing helpful knowledge that's kept from us all, and helping people speak, and uh, fighting for the right to be heard and speak, and that's what we're doing, okay? Now, moving along. I received a couple of packages while I was away, <laughs> and uh, Sarah is one of those gift beans. <laughs> and I remember she phoned me, I was up north, she goes, oh, I opened up a package of yours, I thought it was mine. I'm like, no, you did, my name was on it. How did you think that? You just wanted to open it, <laughs> right? So let's get that one first. So she already opened it. I haven't opened it. I haven't even looked at it. I have a feeling I know what it is. So uh, there's, there's so many kind people out there, you guys. So many. And, um, Shit, the packaging thing is off. I'm gonna have to add the, the name. So it's a good friend of ours, uh, Swarovski rep from Washington State. Uh, we've had exchange emails a couple times. He's gonna help me get my my other Swarovski binoculars I've had forever who that need to be repaired, get them shipped out, get them repaired. He's also lined me up with another guy to possibly get a deal on a new pair. And I've been panicking and busier than shit trying to get a way to go hunting and I I figured, oh yeah, I got a pair of Leica binoculars I had in my safe forever, given to me as a tip as well years back, so I grabbed those. And uh, in the meantime, he sent me a box of Swarovski stuff. Very kind. Look at this. I guess that's called a beanie these days, right? Not a toque. Swarovski beanie. Look at that. There's a Swarovski toque. Could have used that last week. That's a cool hat. Look at this shit. How kind is that? Swarovski, and uh, I'm, you guys know I'm not sponsored by anybody, ever, nothing. But I will say with confidence that uh, Swarovski binoculars and optics have been my go-to, my favorite, forever. I just have. You can see in all my hunting videos, and this is from John. Got your note, John. Thank you so much. I wish your last name was on here. I can't remember it, but I will make mention. What are these? This must be, oh, they're wipes for the lenses. Hang them off here. Probably hang them off your elk call or whatever. Binocular strap, and I got a handful of those sent in here too. So, John, that is so kind and generous. It's ridiculous, and I absolutely appreciate it. And it was time for me to get new hats too. 
and I will be wearing those for sure um, for the rest of my hunts this year and next year until I absolutely ruin them. <laughs> but anyway, I absolutely appreciate that, man. And you know, a handful of people have mailed me stuff in the past. I don't encourage it. I don't ask for it. Gifts actually make me feel awkward. I don't know why they just do. And, um, but it's absolutely appreciated, okay? Now what's this one? This is a hunting knife. Okay, Patrick. I think, Patrick, you're going to make me a custom knife. How crazy is that? Crazy kind. And hopefully get it to me before hunting. And I think it got turned around in customs or something. They probably thought it was going to take down the country, right? And just so you guys know, my other hunter brother in the States sent me this Cutco knife uh, a couple years ago. What a one of my favorite knives ever. And this knife still goes with me everywhere. And it was the first knife to uh, help process my elk last week. And there's still blood on it. So there you go. I still have it. It goes everywhere with me. If it isn't in my pocket, it's in the console of my truck. So I'll use that to open up this. Surprise the uh, customs let a dangerous knife go through the border. Oh my god. God. But what am I doing here? I don't want to ruin anything. It's funny, people say, hey man, what's your P.O. box? What's your mailing address? And I'll give it to them and all I simply say is make sure it doesn't explode when I get it, okay? <laughs> That's all I ever say. And thank them. Now, what do we got? I'm excited. I'm guessing that's it. There's no... Couple cards. No explosives, no poisonous white powder. That's a success. <laughs> All right, so this is from, <clears throat> excuse me, Howling Wolf, Howling Wolf Knife Works. Pat Biggin, Elkhorn, Wisconsin. Pat, you're the man. Let's see, oh, I can't wait to see your, uh, your skills coming up right here. Two part, hopefully this doesn't explode. We got. Oh wow, look at that. Look at that little devil right there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh wow. How freaking cool is that little devil there? You know, this, this looks like a tiny knife, but this knife right here, I could process an entire 1800 pound moose with this. Easy. Just with that. That's pretty cool, man. That was very cool. Very, very cool. I don't want to hate getting, when you get gifts like this, it's, the thing that stresses me out is uh, potentially losing. All right, I'm going to read this to all you who are, who are, who are um, familiar with knife building, because I sure, I am not. I'll share this with you. Steve. This is my most commonly made hunter. Steel is 80 CRV2 carbon steel. Handle is bloodwood. If you ever need it seared, tape, tape on top of that. I do that for cost of shipping both ways. Wash dry coat with mineral oil to prevent rusting. Sheath is water something. You're right, you're right like me, man. Is water slash mildew treated? Sheath is water slash mildew treated. Pat B. Blade made incisor. So freaking cool. Here's the note. Here's the first note that came in. P.S. included a second smaller blade stone washed 80 CRV2 and curly maple handle. Thought maybe Sarah would like an like an around the house garden work not now nope my knife both my knives she gets way too many gifts these are mine i hope she doesn't watch this video because she'll latch onto that knife and take it from me all right here we go here we got excited
how frick it cools out. Wow, that is good steel. That's, that right there is all you need as well. Very cool. What a very, very kind, generous thing to do, man. Absolutely appreciate it, and I will be taking these. These will be in my backpack for sure. Without a doubt. And here's my other gift that came through from the people here. How kind is that? So kind. I don't even know what to say. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. And no, I do not encourage people to send me things, okay? Um, but if you feel you have to, email me. There you go. I'm speechless. Thank you so much. There's so many kind people here. There's far, far more kind people here than not, and that is for sure. Don't you think? Now, let's get on with some hearing some important voices from the people, shall we? And don't forget, if you can, make sure to hit the links that I provided in the video description from yesterday's video, and just listen to those, and possibly, possibly pass them on to somebody who may be lacking a little bit of factual knowledge and pass it on to them. It's very important, all right? Now, let me see what we got. So the title is, Hi, Figuring Out If You Are Steve Isdall. Hi, Steve. We want to correspond, but so many imposters have hit us up lately. We want to make sure it's you. Will you say the line, potato salad, somewhere in your next video? We have a lot to share. Best Paula from Shenandoah Valley, Virginia, USA. There you go. Done. <laughs> potato salad. It's really me. It's really me. I better mark that as red. Not that I'd probably forget reading that one. That's a first. <clears throat> Hope that helps. Get it into us. Share it with all the people. You got something. Mark, this is red. <clears throat> a deer hunt to remember. Hi, Steve. My name is Ernie. I've been putting off sending us information for a while. Everybody does, man. Everybody does. Some people wait 40 years. However, after listening to your platform for about a year, I've decided to send this in. It was about 87 or so when I was camped in the western mountains of the Coast Range at a campground called Wells Cabin Campground. I was with my dad and my sister. We'd gone to bed about 9.30 and I was excited about the day deer hunt. It was a moonlit night. I had my dog tied to my cot and was sleeping outside on my cot. The only other people camped at the campground at the time were Mongs? The reason I bring this up is because if someone wanted to dress up to intimidate a Bigfoot, these people are way too small. Whatever that is. About 3 in the morning, as was awakened by the dogs, at 3 in the morning was awoken by the dogs growling and tugging on my cot. I opened my eyes to see this huge being standing upright looking in the back of my pickup. It had a huge chest that was full of dark hair. It looked to be well over eight feet in height. As I raised my head off my pillow, the beast turned and then walked upright behind my truck. It towered over the bed, and I remember it was taller than my pickup cab. It was walking on two legs. I don't know why, but I just figured it was a bear and went back to sleep. The next morning, we went hunting for deer. We came back after lunch. My other sister showed up with my two nieces. I had seen a mountain lion track the day before in an opening below camp and decided to show them the mountain lion track. As we were walking back to camp, we walked through the opening near camp and I saw a barefoot, and I saw the barefoot tracks of a man type. I showed my nieces. I tried to step the stride of this big foot, but could not reach the next footprint as far as I could stride. The track, excel, it's, the track itself was a good 18 inch long and probably six inches wide. I did not believe in Bigfoot before this, but believe me, I do now. I've been in the mountains a lot, and I'm always looking for tracks of animals, but I have never seen a track like this before, and I have not seen a track like this since. I do know if this creature wanted to hurt me that night, it could have easily killed me and my dog. I do know that if I did see one hunting, I would not shoot it. I'm just intrigued as how it survives. I told my dad about what I saw. He did not say a thing. However, just before we passed, he did tell me that years ago while hunting with his hounds, he saw a Bigfoot cross a dirt road in front of him. 
Thanks, Steve, for the opportunity to tell my story. Ernie, Ernie, welcome to the club, right? Welcome to the club. So many people, so many people carry it with them their entire life, just like your dad did, right? Don't share it. Pretty sure this channel's changing a lot of that, right? Pretty sure. Appreciate your time, man, that you took to send, send that to the people through me. Appreciate it. The next one is titled Hunter's DNA. Hey Steve, hope you and yours are well. I would appreciate it if you could share a few facts about how hunters like yourself and all those heard and unheard are perceived by like-minded people from the UK. I've always held real hunters in high regard for the tenacity, grit, pride, and above all else, your sheer honesty. What I would give or do just to experience just a blink of what is all around you and what you hold so dear. I get to see a few arrows fly with my compound bow on a building site now and again if I'm lucky. I love the life you happily share with us all and I can hope I may get a glimpse of the absolute paradise you call home in the next life. Respectfully yours, P.S. Moxon, UK. Appreciate that man, appreciate those kind words. Oh, uh, I'll tell you what, you know, if you, you can look, go look up the other channels is called How to Hunt. I think it's one word, isn't it? My other channel and it's absolutely geared up with just hunting and angling on it. So if you want to go look, if I think about it, I'll put the link to that channel in the description of this one below. Okay. And it's all hunting and angling that I've shared on that, on that channel for people like you and others. Okay. I appreciate that kind of email and your kind words and I hope you're surviving that shit show over there. The absolute shit show that the planet is um, started. The dark bastards. I know it's real rough in the UK right now and all of Europe. And it's all because of the dark sons of bitches that are attempting to do some real nasty things to us. That's another topic. Now, listen to this one. I have a Bigfoot encounter story. I tried to email you, but it says not valid address. And I'm not com a computer person. Oh, well, well. I lived with my now ex-husband in a remote place along the Spoon River in Illinois. One road in and out. At the time we lived at the top of the hill and had only one neighbor at the bottom of the hill. When it was so dark out there, it was dark. I worked night shift, night shift as an RN. On moonlit nights you could see very well and I would go out into the pasture and hang out with my horses and dance. They were usually peaceful at night or resting. I don't know, I just was awake and spent time in the in the moonlit cool summer air. You know what, I do that all the time too. I used to always go out and just hang out with my horses in the middle of the night and just hang with them. It went on a nice evening. So one night, if you reply, Captain, if you reply, Garnet Green will also be able to call you Ul El Nilv. What? I just was a vent a loose. I was, I juicy was a vent a loo. Spent time in the moonlit cool summer air. All right. So one night I'm out with them dancing, kind of playing tag and a couple horses who like to do this. And I felt like something is watching me. So I started looking along the tree line and I see a big dark shadow in a pine tree. I started going towards it. I don't know why, but I was drawn towards it. I see it hide behind the pine. So like a dumbass, I have to go see what it is. I make my way through the pasture to the tree. The only thing separating me from this gigantic, at least eight foot tall, hairy bear slash monkey thing is a pine tree branch. I look up at it and it's dark eyes with a little glimmer of gold look down at me. The feeling was inquisitive. The hairy thing was upright on two. The hairy thing was upright on two. Hairy thing was upright on two legs. Type twice, no biggie. I said, hello, and then I got scared. You see, I like to dance naked in the moonlight, and so I was totally naked at this time. Realizing this, I backed away, and then ran as fast as I could in the house and locked all the doors. No, I wasn't on drugs. I think the hairy big guy slash girl thought I was crazy, so it didn't kill me. And I think since I did this a lot, it had been watching me for a while. This happened in the summer 2013. I'm sure it's moved out of the area since, but, but I saw your channel on YouTube and felt like sharing my encounter. I love the places you show on your channel. Very beautiful. Stay safe in your adventures. Take care. All right. Yeah, well, you're lucky uh, 
you didn't knee jerk that thing into wanting a little more than just looking at you. Possibly, right? It's funny, I know a couple of girls in Pound BC, they're out looking for wild mushrooms and it was absolutely, she said it was just so comfortable and hot out. Her and her girlfriend stripped down and, and were just basically in their birthday suits in the woods having a good time looking for wild mushrooms and she said all of a sudden they got, they both had this overwhelming feeling of being watched and stared at and scared the shit out of them. They got, got the gear together, got the hell out of there, so yeah. It's not a first I've heard of something similar. Here comes another one. It's titled, Keeping It To Myself. Hi Steve, been listening to your videos now for over a year and never subscribed, and subscribed until now. It's nice to finally know I'm not alone and there is someone like you giving us a safe place to share our experiences. I'm from northern New York, up near the Canadian border, St. Lawrence County, in a little town called South Russell. I'm soon to be 49 years old, and I've kept what happened to me to myself all these years, sharing only with a limited few over the years. You can call me H. You can call me H. W. Marchat the third. Marschat the third. I'm the only one left in existence now. My father has passed on some years ago, and my grandfather years before him. Anyway, my first incident happened when I was just two, maybe three years old. However, I remember it like yesterday. We lived in a very, very rural area at the time, just a town away from where I live now. It was myself and my two older sisters that it happened to. At the time, my parents were still together, and we lived in a very old rundown house, like I said, in the middle of nowhere. My two sisters and I shared a bedroom together upstairs at this house, and my mother and father and baby sister slept downstairs. I can't tell you the time of the year this happened because of my age at the time. It was late in the night, and we were all asleep. The bedroom my sisters and I shared was an L Cove style bedroom. I slept alone in my own bed up in the longer part of the room, and my two sisters slept together in the same bed. Their bed was in the L part of the room, so from where my bed was and their bed was, I could only see the foot of their bed. So anyway, it was late in the night, maybe early morning, I'd awoke to my oldest sister screaming, a blood-curdling scream. And then soon my other sister joined into the screaming. The only thing I knew to do was to keep my head covered up and scared shitless, excuse me, not knowing what to do or think, when all of a sudden my blanket was ripped from off of my bed, and there it was. I can't describe it any better than it was a Yeti, a Bigfoot, or whatever. Huge, hairy, with burning red eyes standing in a room. Of course, I joined into the screaming along with my sisters. At that point, my parents burst through the bedroom door and it vanished like into thin air. It was very traumatizing for all three of us because my parents didn't see it. My mom closed that room off the remainder of the time we lived there and we all slept in the living room until we moved without another incident. Now let's skip forward five, maybe six years, and by now my parents have split, my mother is dating another man when my second incident happened, but only this time it happened to all of us. We lived in a small trailer, like almost camper-sized. The year I believe was 1980 summertime. It first started with me. My mother just started dating this guy, and at the time my mom and us kids were living with my, were living with my grandmother. My mom had been dating this guy for a bit and was staying with him while my sisters and I were left at my grandmother's. One evening, my mom was getting ready to go stay another night with this guy and I begged her to let me come along. She gave in and allowed me to come. Steve, I lived, pretty, a pretty, Steve, I lived a pretty effed up childhood to say the least, but that's another story another time. My first night staying with my mom and new boyfriend in this little shitbox trailer was when it started. I slept out on the couch in the living room. And this trailer had these little rectangle windows high up near the ceiling, about four inches tall and a foot long. As I lay on the couch looking at this window, I kept noticing red glowing eyes. I thought this has to be me or a reflection or something. All the lights were off, pitch black, no way there was anything that could have caused this from inside. The eyes would blink. I could hear a movement outside of that same window wall. I had no choice but to scream for my mom. After all, I was only seven years old and had been through a lot at that point in my life. Well, it only gets worse from there. Eventually, all my sister and I and my mother, eventually, all my sisters and I and mother moved into this guy. For a full year, we lived in hell with incidents happening nightly. 
This thing did shit that was unbelievable. We pound on the trailer and at one point got upon the roof. It could jump fences like nothing and would be gone as soon as it came. The smell was horrendous at times. We eventually got a German Shepherd thinking it would help. There were times that dog was terrified and wouldn't move when this thing was around. We even had an electric fence installed around the trailer hooked up to 220 voltage. That's how serious it was. For a year we lived in hell with tons of incidents too many to tell. I believe in Bigfoot and I also believe they are paranormal. I've had other incidents in my life since then, but nothing like that hell of 1980. And I'm an avid hunter and I hunt alone and I've never had an experience in the woods yet and hopefully I never do. Sorry this is so long. I appreciate what you do and admire you. You're a man's man and keep on keeping on. I look forward to more of your videos. Great respect. H.W. Marschat III. I hope I didn't butcher your last name, man. Appreciate you sending that in. Kind of sucks to hear that you you went through hell as a boy, but many, probably more families do than don't, right? It's not all it's not all uh, perfect existences like they try to portray on TV. <laughs> Main thing we do is not repeat the not repeat the mistakes the adults made before us, and uh, try to be better, right? And never give up. But anyway. Uh, <clears throat> I'd be curious to know if you or any of you had a uh, clear visual of that thing, <clears throat> excuse me, with all those other incidents. You know, if your sisters are still alive and well, uh, maybe you might even want to possibly send them this, send them this video and it might bring some sort of closure, some kind of help or release for them in some weird way. You never know if, if they can hear this um, spoken of and read aloud. Um, in confidence in a safe place, right? But anyway, be safe out there, man. Thanks for your kind words and support. I can only imagine what went on around there, nonstop. What a shitty deal, right? I don't understand why some of these beings decide to do that to innocent people minding their own business. I haven't a clue. But it is what it is, right? It is what it is. We're figuring this shit out slowly, day by day, we're figuring it out together. Missing Corn Feeder Under Working Game Cam is the title of this email. Steve, I've been following you since you first started addressing this subject. Many thanks for bringing the people's truth to the masses. Like many subjects, we conspiracy theorists are ridiculed for the things we are aware of because we are dialed in and don't listen to the powers that be. When our so-called conspiracies play out as fact, they deflect and change the narrative. Anyhow, I'm preaching to the choir. Well, you know what, all I can say is anyone who instantly knee-jerk replies with conspiracy theories is just a coward. They're scared shitless of the topic, they don't want the topic to be real, they don't want to deal with it, and they have been taught by mainstream to simply say, you're a conspiracy theorist, right? It's like calling somebody a racist if you don't like what they're saying. It's just a weaponized frickin' term. And they can stuff their conspiracy theorist words up their asses. I live in Madison, Mississippi. I've never had an encounter myself. I've never had mind speak or anything like that, but I'm very intuitive and I have no doubt in these things' existence. Out of the millions of reported experiences, it only takes one person telling the truth to make these beings reality. That is not a, this is not a sighting, but rather two consecutive game cam images of a corn feeder on a small private family property. It happens to border property owned by one of the Primos brothers, Primos Game Calls. The first image shows the feeder on the ground with the lid lying in front of the... The first image shows the feeder on the ground with the lid lying in front of the ground, lying in front on the ground. The next image, about 12 hours later, shows deer and the lid, but the feeder is gone. Only one leg of the tripod is lying on the ground. I know the first reaction is, this is a hoax. I can tell you that my daughter's boyfriend, police officer, and my son set up this Tacticam, wireless cellular, cellular images sent as they are taken, and we have no explanation to the disappearance of the feeder. No wind today, no flooding, and no other images of the feeder being moved. Interestingly, no deer at the site for about 12 hours and the feeder is gone. Thanks for what you do, Mike. Well, that's creepy, dude. That is creepier than shit. 
I'm familiar with those feeders. A bunch of my friends in Alabama use those. And uh, that's just flat out creepy. Why would they want the feeder? Maybe they got their own food plot in another planet somewhere, <laughs> right? But that is, uh, I can't, this camera doesn't autofocus, so I can't go like this with it. So I'm gonna have to share these. Hopefully remember to share these pictures in the video. And uh, yeah, that's nothing I'd wanna come across in my private hunting property because that makes you look over your shoulder nonstop, right? Which kind of sucks when you don't want to look over your shoulder nonstop. But anyway, man, thanks for sending that in. I'll bet you uh, if you can talk to any of the neighboring hunt properties or neighbors or whatever, if you ever bump into them at the corner store, just look them square in the eye and square up and ask them flat out if they have seen or heard of anything real weird going on around here ever before, like any kind of weird sightings or whatever. And don't laugh and I'll guarantee you, you're gonna get some feedback, without a doubt. Thanks for sending that in, man, appreciate you. All right, one more, and then I gotta turn into the neighborhood butcher, this elk. And this is titled, My Experiences. Hello Steve, my name is Peter Douglas. You can use my name. I'm 66 years old. I was born and raised on a farm in southern Ontario. I took the farm over from my father and lived there for 58 years until moving into town eight years ago. One thing about farming is that it makes you a realist and humble also. Mother Nature will let you know early on that she doesn't give a shit about you or your livelihood. <laughs> no doubt. Farmers, man, I got huge respect for them. They are tough sons of bitches, I'll tell you what. My father was a fair but no bullshit kind of dad. He was born in the early 1920s, so was a product of the Depression and World War II era. One thing that I learned early on was that lying was a cardinal sin in his book. Because of this, I've never been a good liar. Conversely, it pisses me off if someone calls me a liar. So, now to tell you of three things that I've witnessed in the last few years that usually are met with silence or raised eyebrows. Number one happened while driving my tractor with a load of hay from one farm to my home place. The area I farmed in was known as having more wildlife than most in southern Ontario. I was coming up to a spot where the bush was along both sides of the road. I knew this was a popular deer crossing, having whitetail hunted this area for decades. My farm mutt walker cross Dalmatian was running alongside the tractor as usual. It was then, it was when he bolted ahead that my gaze followed him. And there about 100 yards ahead of me was a cougar running across the road. Bud, the dog, ran to the bush slash swamp on the cat's trail. No one could accuse Bud of being all that smart, but he was definitely fearless. He was only out of sight for 10 seconds. He came running back out on his tracks looking like he had just had his life pass before his eyes. The MNR said there is no way what I saw was a cougar. What a bunch of idiots. I can tell you it was not a bobcat or a lynx. It was taller than my dog and had a long tail. I have since seen large cat tracks in the snow in December in the December deer hunt. I don't pretend to be any kind of a cougar expert, but these tracks were quite a bit larger than a big dog's. Also, there was a, a groove in the snow where it looked like its tail was dragging. Is that possible, Steve? Story, yeah, 100%. Of course they're there. 100%. Without a doubt. Never ask the government or any government employees for confirmation of anything. They don't count anymore. On the most part. Not all, but most. Fuck them. Story number two happened July 2018. My wife and two of my grandkids were sitting on our patio just relaxing. It was around sunset, and the sky was orange and pink in the west. Our house is on the west side of... Excuse me. Walkerton, Ontario, with farm fields touching the back of her lot. My wife was seated facing the west and she said, what's that? I was seated facing south, so I looked to the right and there it was. About 30 degrees above the horizon was a brilliant silver colored T-shaped something. There, there was a bit of a bulge where the horizontal and vertical arm met. It was totally silent and never moved. After about five minutes, it started to fade like a light on a thermostat-style light switch. I'm thinking that's what you're thinking, rheostat. 
real stat style light switch. Just before it faded out, the vertical arm waved back and forth like a ribbon in a light breeze. We sat there scratching our heads as to what this could have been. Ten minutes later, it was back and the whole scenario repeated itself exactly. What the hell? Because there was no sound or movement, I can't say how far away and thusly how big it was. I still can't believe we all sat and watched and not no one thought of getting a camera. That's common. I, I'm guilty of that too, man. You're too focused and mesmerized at what the app you're seeing. You don't think about anything else. I don't know if it was an alien ship, but I've heard they are seen more frequently, frequently around nuclear facilities. Bruce Nuclear, which is the world's largest nuclear plant, is pretty much straight in line with where this thing was. That's 25 to 30 miles away, so if it was near there, it was huge. My third inexplicable experiences have happened at our hunting camp in the North Bay, Ontario area. Let me say in my 66 years, I've spent thousands of hours working or hunting in the forest. Because of this, I can say I know the sounds the bush can make. I know what squirrels running and dry leaves sounds like. Also, what deer and moose sound like walking, running, or rubbing brush with their racks. In the 35 years I've hunted the North Bay area, I have heard probably 8 to 10 loud knocks. These weren't creaking, cracking sounds the bush can make, even on a calm day. Each time I heard these sounds, I was still hunting, and the place was quiet. It sounded like someone or something picked up a fence post the size, a fence post size stick and wound up and nailed a tree. I never thought anything of it until I started watching your videos about a year ago now. The reports of knocking made me start to wonder if this is what I was hearing. I might also add that I googled Sasquatch sightings in Ontario and the North Bay area has had numerous. It goes without saying, there are a lot of streams and lakes in this area. Farmers are probably as skeptical as any other group of people, but this is okay, especially in today's bullshit world. I include myself. 20 years ago, I would never have believed there were big cats in southern Ontario, but I saw it. I wouldn't have believed there would be bright silvery, silvery white somethings floating in the sky, but I saw it. While I haven't seen a Sasquatch, I've certainly heard loud knocks of sound out of place in the bush 20 miles from anyone, but I heard them. You can say, I'm a delusional crackpot, I don't give an F, my skin's thick. My point, I guess, is don't ridicule someone if you haven't experienced what they have. I'm not a religious guy, but I do believe you should do unto others as you would have done to you, Peter Douglas. Peter, appreciate you, man. And I have no doubt you saw what you saw and no doubt you heard what you heard. Not at all. <laughs> it's funny, uh, side note, absolutely appreciate your time sending that, sir. Big time, be safe out there. And mail us back anything else that you might come across that may help somebody, all right? Now, a side note, I... Do you guys remember that old show where there's two guys who were movie critics, Siskel and Ebert? Remember that? Well, one of them, Somebody, I forget how I came across this, but one of them died, but apparently he died and they brought him back. And when he came back, he was absolute clear of mind. I think he was clear of mind before he died too. You can Google it up and find the, uh, do an internet search, I mean, and, and find it. But he reportedly said crystal clear of mind. I think what he said was nothing in our world is what it seems to us and i don't know why but when he said that i really took note of that i can't i think about that i think about him saying i think about those words often because from what i have been learning that holds to be absolutely true nothing is what it seems nothing unfortunately and that's why we're here right because many of us Myself and many others are sick and tired of the bullshit feed, right? We've been fed bullshit since day one. It's frustrating. It's funny, you know, when I'm out in those mountains in the middle of nowhere by myself, I'm just down there looking up at the sky, look at the mountains, and I'm looking at the real world and doing what I'm intended to be doing. And then it's like changing the channel, a quickly glimpse to, say, our Canadian politicians and what they are doing and the shit show being slammed onto the people and, it, and it, it's just amazing how insane it all seems once you have been in the real world relying on yourself and doing what you love to do for x amount of days and then you have to change the channel and go back to the shit show and the bullshit stands out so clear 
It's very frustrating. But that as well gives me the fuel to do what I'm doing, right? The bullshit's thick. You know, you go outside, or take, a, take a look at our world, look down from way up in the air, and you look down on our world, and you realize that everything that we need to survive is on that, is here. And then you, you look closer and you realize that there's actually human beings who are making us pay to survive here in this world. That is so, so wrong. I can guarantee you that is not the way life was intended to be for us. There's just no way. It wasn't intended. We were not intended to be controlled, told what to do. And we were not given this life with the intention of having to pay somebody else with an equal life our money to survive. It just wasn't. It's just not. I could go on. <laughs> I could go on. Two coffees in me. It's time to get my ass in gear, man. I gotta get this elk, the rest of this elk taken care of, dropped off the trim to a uh, place in town here and get all my sausages made. And I'll be back with more voices to be heard shortly. And don't forget, I'm gonna put that, I have a video that I'm gonna put together, an explanation of how to possibly get better during hot, unseasonable weather. And I'm gonna put that on the other channel, possibly today too, the How to Hunt channel, all right? And uh, thank you so much for the gifts that were given to me. I so appreciate them. And um, I'll be back shortly.